Welcome to Gearbox Talk, brought to you by Go Wild. I'm your host, Brad Luttrell, and I'm also the co-founder of Go Wild, which is actually how I met today's guest. Captain James Nash is a Go Wild member. I met him before, really, I finding him on the app, but more importantly than any of that, this dude is a Purple Heart recipient, and as you'll hear in today's show, he's an extremely talented hunting guide who has seen a ton of success. He spends more than 300 days a year outside in the field. He's seen more than 100 elk taken on hunts, and when you think about how much knowledge it takes to do that, it's, it's really pretty incredible. And I think it'll take you all of about a minute of hearing James talk about broadheads to realize that this guy has forgotten more about broadheads than most people will ever get the chance to know. And he he shares his experience with each type of broadhead and how much success he's seen and his his what he likes or doesn't like about that type. And I mean, for example, you might be surprised to hear James mention a a certain type of broadhead. And we'll get into it in the show, but he, he talks about a popular broadhead that actually creates so much compression in the bone that he rarely sees a full pass through from this type of broadhead at all. Seriously, we're going to get into it. We're going to talk about some of the brands you've heard of and like, like some muzzies and kudus, but stick around because we're going to hear about what broadheads James actually shoots. And I, I'd almost guarantee you've probably never heard of this broadhead. It was, it, it's cool. It's, it's a, uh, it's a smaller brand and James talks about why he likes them. But if you've heard of them, let me know in the comments. I'll be interested to hear if anybody had, but, uh, he's, he's going to tell all, and we're going to link to all of James's recommendations in the show notes. And remember, if you buy through these links, we make money. And if we make money, we get to donate that to raise them outdoors. It's, it's a nonprofit that teaches kids to hunt fish and camp. And if you weren't sure you needed new broadheads, I just want to remind you to think of the children. All right. And finally, please subscribe to hear from more, from more experts like Captain James Nash in the future. And trust me, we have some amazing shows ahead. And I think I think we've continued to prove that uh, through each show. We've had some high, high-quality guests on here. We've had some really great discussions. And that's not going to stop anywhere in the near future. So make sure you're subscribed, whether it's on podcast or YouTube. All right. Let's get into Gearbox Talk with James Nash. Nash got one of my guys back from a Restless Native episode to join my new podcast, Gearbox Talk, a show all about gear. You're out in the middle of nowhere, you tell me, and I, I'm glad you're able to make it. Welcome aboard, man. Yeah, it's good to see you again, Brad. It's been too long. It, yeah, dude. And if anybody uh, is is noticing the lag on this, it's because James is he spends more than 300 days. I asked him early, before we started, it used to be around 300, and now it's even more. So tell us a little bit about who you are, man, and what you're doing in the middle of nowhere. And so I'm, um, I'm an outfitter and a professional hunter. Um, and then I, I, I fish and trap and, and just kind of live outside for the most part. So I work, um, work all over the West and a little bit internationally and, uh, work with a bunch of different brands, which I really enjoy. And, uh, right now I'm getting ready for archery season, um, it's a little bit more than a month away, which is a very small amount of time. It's something that I work year round for and, uh, yeah, just kind of getting things ready to go for that. So I, I got to know James through our mutual friend, Cody Rich. And if you really enjoy this podcast, go find some of James. James has been on Cody's podcast, the rich outdoor show. I don't know, James, probably half a dozen times or more. And, uh, they're fascinating episodes for anybody. It's not, not a lot of Cody's show is Western hunting, but a lot of what James talks about in a couple of his episodes are just really great. It's, it's hunting, um, you know, in general, it's going to be, it's like archery discussions that are going to apply to whitetail, uh, the way you think about broadheads. And that's exactly why I brought you in here today. I told my team, I said, I've never heard anybody analyze broadheads uh from anecdotal experience but it like at, at the way you do it like it's almost like you're running scientific tests because you you 
spend so much time around people who are are chasing big game, shooting elk. With, with, you've seen it all. You know your hunters are coming through. You're seeing a lot of these different brands, different types of broadheads, and and you've seen it all in some level or another attempted. And you know for one person to to uh, you know, I can't think of one person who would have a better opinion on it than you because you do spend so much time. Like you said, most of your life is <laughs> spent out outdoors in some manner or another, man. So I, I like when we when we were do, we wanted to do a broadhead show, and I was like, I got to get James on because that that last episode I listened to you, and you may have been on since then. I apologize if I've missed any, but the last one where with Cody uh, last year, where you just completely went through and talked th- so much detail about the broadheads, uh, I was like, I got to get that guy on. So James is going to talk. To us today about different types of broadheads, you know the grain weights, the number of b- blades. I think we'll hear a little bit from brands he likes. And, and um, first, though, James, just kind of talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, as a guide, some of your recommendations to hunters when they're coming in, and, and what you what your starting point for that discussion is, and, and how you advise them w- when they're coming in to chase elk or, or whatever it is with you. Well, first of all, we have to talk about the the importance of a broadhead and the way that I explain it to people is that every single part of your hunting system is just a supporting effort for getting your broadhead inside of an animal, right? So you start with, you know, a $50,000 truck to drive you to the trailhead. And then you've got this thousand dollar bow and a $300 sight and arrows that are $180 a dozen and $400 boots, everything, everything that you're doing, your calls, it, everything possible in your hunting system is just trying to get that broadhead into an animal. Um, so we need to realize that the most important part of this entire system is the broadhead. And if that portion fails, then nothing before that mattered, and nothing after that matters. So having a broadhead that does not fail is the most important thing you can do as an archery hunter. And after you've spent all of that money and all that time and hard work to be able to get to that point, like don't buy a broadhead because it's on sale. Don't try and save a couple dollars at that point. Like this is where you need to maybe spend a little bit more money if you have to, or at least get something that's going to function no matter what. Right. Right. I like that. So, uh, again, part of what he's going to be dissecting is what what he's seen function so james uh kind of one of the first i wanted to hit one of the biggest debates i see playing out on our app or in hunting forums in general man we're going to dive right into it fixed versus mechanical i'm excited to hear you relive this because again i've heard you talk about it before but um you got a hunter coming in and they're asking you that question what's your answer um absolutely do not bring mechanical broadheads on an elk hunt a lot of places don't even allow it it's not legal Um, and mechanical broadheads have come a long ways and there are things about them that can make them have superior flight characteristics in the air. But the reality is if you have good arrows and your bows tuned correctly, a fixed blade broadhead flies with the same accuracy potential as a mechanical broadhead. And I know people are going to have heartburn hearing that because it's not what they've kind of been led to believe, but the reality is a well-tuned bow will shoot a fixed blade broadhead, even a really large fixed blade broadhead with field point accuracy. Now, when you see field point accuracy, um, that doesn't mean that it's going to hit at the same point on the target as your field point. It just means that it's going to be reliable and it's going to hit the same point every single time. Um, Accuracy is about repeatability. Precision is about being able to hit exactly where you intend to. So just understand that, you know, if you're not getting good arrow flight, um, when you put broadheads on, that's not the broadheads fault. That's something that's going on with, with your bow or with the way that you are shooting your bow. And that needs to be corrected first. So you mentioned with elk, I mean, uh, are there scenarios in which you, you don't mind a mechanical broadhead? Um, no, I, I'm never okay with a mechanical broadhead because it has moving parts. Yeah. Um, and these are these are big, heavy animals, and they're muddy. They have really coarse hair. Um, a bull elk likes to wallow, so he's covered in mud. And if you, you know, just imagine taking your favorite knife, you know, whether you're using a, a 
a real knife or using a Havlon or something like that. And then you take a really muddy, hairy animal and then you just scrape your blade across it to try and cut through all of that hair. That's like the worst thing you can do for your knife. You're cutting through <laughs> little tiny pieces of rock. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the first thing that your broadhead has to do once it hits the animal. Um, some broadheads have features that help them fly a little bit better and help with your, with your arrow um, as soon as it's leaving the bow. And we can get into that in a minute. But um, I don't want there to be any possibility of failure. And if I have a moving line, um, so fixed blade is definitely the way to go. And then I also do not want removable blades. Um, I was going to ask like, you about that. Yeah. Uh, replaceable blades are like throwaway razors. Um, <laughs> they're not going to last very long. You're certainly not going to be able to shoot multiple animals with them. Um, yeah. And I want a broadhead to be able to last me for a long time through multiple animals and multiple years. Are you, are you, um, for, for, this is kind of more of a newbie question, but for, because I think this is, this podcast is going to appeal well to some, some of the beginners, but also maybe some people who've been shooting a while. I saw a guy post on go wild, um, this morning and he actually said, you know, Hey, I've been archery hunting for years and I'm still not good at it. There's a lot to learn, right? So are you taking your broadheads and sharpening them and maintaining them? Or do you buy new Look, a answer a little bit of your philosophy on that too? I sharpen everything and I sharpen it right out of the package and then every time that it hits a target so after i practice with a broadhead and before i go hunting with it it's going to get sharpened again and there's some easy ways to do it and some hard ways to do it some of the broadheads that don't have a straight edge like uh like the kudu for example mm -hmm. um it has a a a concave edge and that's helpful for cutting but it can be difficult to sharpen because now what do i use to sharpen it um, so with some of those, the easiest way is just to carve down a little piece of wood until it's curved, wrap some sandpaper over it. And now you can sharpen those concave surfaces really easily. Um, I, pref I only use single bevel broadheads. So that means that they're only sharpened on one side of the blade. Um, you know, most of your knife edges are going to be sharpened like this. And then a single bevel is going to have a flat edge and then a beveled edge. And then on the opposite blade, the bevel will be in the opposite direction and that does a few things for you and I'll, I'll get into single bevel versus double bevel here in a minute but that's really important at, at really every stage from the release of the arrow all the way through the other side of that animal let's talk about that i mean if you're if uh, it makes sense let's talk about the single bevel versus the double okay so with with the single bevel as soon as you release the arrow you have opposing pressures on each side of that broadhead in the same way that when you have helical or offset on your veins on the back of the arrow that helps the arrow spin but if say you have offset on your veins and from the back of the arrow it's causing torque torque is any type of force that tends to cause rotation um, you have some torque occurring and that is impacting the shaft itself because it's twisting the shaft of the arrow. Now Archer's paradox is where you have reflex and deflex of the arrow as it leaves the string. And that's why arrows have different spines based on your draw length and your draw weight and how much weight you have on the tip of the arrow. So that reflex deflex Archer's paradox is really important for accuracy. If you have an arrow that's made of titanium and has no flexibility at all, any type of counter pressure on the back end of it is going to cause it to drive in the opposite direction and you'll never be able to get accurate flight out of it. So if I have a single bevel on the front end of the arrow and helical or offset at the back of the end of the arrow, and they're both causing torque in the same direction, then I haven't created any torsion in the arrow shaft. So it can go through that reflex deflex cycle, very repeatable um, and without causing any sort of anti-force mechanisms. Um, very, very important. So then that arrow is going to stabilize that much faster and that torque is going to cause rotation both from the rear and from the front of the arrow. So now I get an arrow that's stabilized more quickly as it's going downrange. So that's the first major benefit of single bevel. So I'm getting really good arrow flight going downrange. Now my single bevel 
broadhead is not ventilated. It doesn't have any holes cut out of it. Um, and that's helpful because you get less turbulence. Um, turbulence is the way energy fractures. Um, so as, as air is hitting, um, or as the arrow is hitting that air, it's causing that arrow to the air to spin around the broadhead and then around the veins and everything else. Um, so if I have vents in the broadhead blade, I'm going to have more turbulence and more sound. Now, as an arrow moves towards a target, that sound is changing. So if you're on a highway and a car comes towards you, it goes, yeah. right? That's the Doppler effect or a red green effect of the, the sound changing as something coming towards you. I don't think that string jump is a real thing. Um, if you make a sudden sound in the woods, a deer doesn't drop two feet and then spring away, but they have had stuff fly towards them in their lives and they can hear that arrow coming towards them. So if your arrow is quieter by not having ventilated broadheads, you're going to get less reaction from the animal. So that's the second benefit. Now, as soon as it hits, the tip of that broadhead isn't like a, a chisel point like you see on on muzzies or something like that it's called cut on contact so the very tip of the arrow of the broadhead is um and then as it encounters both soft tissue and hard tissue like bone and ligament um that broadhead is going to continue to twist because it has opposing pressures on each side one bevel here one bevel here and it's going to spin as it goes in. Well, when it hits bone like shoulder blade or rib or even the heavier bones like the humerus or even the femur or the pelvis, that torque is going to cause the bone to break. And as it breaks, it's going to leave a cavity for the arrow to pass through. If you have a double bevel, then the pressure of the bone around it is increasing as the broadhead tries to pass into it. So since my, um, since my single bevel broadhead has created torque and broken that bone, now I have a nice pass for the rest of the arrow to flow through and go completely through that animal. And because single bevel is only sharpened on one side, it has less of a, of a fragile angle, sharpened point. You can get it really sharp but then it doesn't take much to get that tip to fold over and then it's no longer sharp. That's why most of the broadheads that you recover from your animal, you know, you couldn't cut yourself with them if you tried to, but with single bevel, it's a really sturdy angle. Um, so it's like a chisel. Okay. You can hammer on wood with a chisel all day long and it's still sharp. Same thing. So after I've gone through muddy, coarse hair, through some muscle, through some ligaments, through bone, now is when I need it to be just as sharp as ever because I need it to cut really well as it goes through the soft tissue of the lungs, arteries, veins, um, everything that's inside that animal. And then I need it to have enough momentum to go all the way through the animal and create a hole on the other sides so that I'm getting blood falling out both sides of the animal. Right. And that was one of the, I learned a lot listening to you talk about recovery of the animal and the importance of getting through and creating those two openings. I mean, so, so for you, it's not just getting in there, but making that exit wound as well, especially on something like an elk. I thought it was interesting to hear you talk about how, um, you know, blood trails are really difficult with them. It, it's going to pull inside of that large cavity. So this is where, again, your broadhead can play a really important role. Can you, can you talk about that just a little bit and, and, um, in the recovery process too? Cause this is kind of, I mean, it's very relevant to what you're talking about right now. Sure. Um, you know, a lot of people shoot for the blood trail. I'm shooting to kill an animal as quickly as possible. Um, and an elk is a big animal. And if you haven't been around them, think of the biggest whitetail buck you've ever seen in your life. You can wad him up and shove him inside the chest cavity of a bull elk. Okay, they're really big. So just think about it in those terms. And an elk can also hold all the blood in his body inside of his chest cavity. So if you shoot um, two thirds of the way up the body and you pop both of his lungs and his lungs fill up with blood, 
his lungs have to fill all the way up with blood to that hole before it starts leaking out. But in that amount of time, he's probably died. So the best shots on elk have no blood trail whatsoever. If I'm seeing blood in a blood trail, I'm concerned about that shot placement. Yeah, really interesting stuff. The uh, the analogy that kind of came through when you're talking about um, your your single bevel with the uh, I was thinking of like a chainsaw. You know, you have a really sharp chainsaw, mm-hmm. and if you're cutting a tree and you get pressure on both sides, it doesn't matter how sharp it is. You, you've you've now you're stuck, right? Like if if it starts to lean in, that pressure hits on both sides, and you can't go anywhere. It kind of uh, clicked with me when you were talking about that. One yeah. thing you you just mentioned that I hear a lot of arguing around too is the weight of the arrow, you know, what, what kind of grain you're shooting. Uh, now this, this is going to definitely, I think like everything you just went through is really applicable to both whitetail and, and elk, uh, in your selection. This, this is where it might start to deviate some, you know, a lot of uh, whitetail hunters are shooting probably lower poundage or they, they can. Um, I, and I, if you can talk about this maybe in two ways of kind of the two different setups, but, you know, talk through some of your philosophy on the weight of the arrow and and the broadheads. So I think the magical zone is between 630 and 670 grains of total arrow weight. Um, And your draw weight really doesn't have anything to do with that. I mean, I shoot 84 pounds because I'm a big guy and it's not that much of a deal for me to pull it. But when I'm shooting a recurve, I'm shooting 55 pounds and I'm shooting the same arrow. And what you'll see with the majority of trad bow guys is they're all shooting a 650 grain arrow because that tends to be what penetrates the best. And the trad bow guys get total pass throughs on elk and deer and everything that they shoot at. It's really amazing. So momentum is huge. And what you have to think of when you're thinking of kinetic energy is It's velocity times velocity times weight. So you have to have two velocities multiplied by each other to have the equivalent of weight. So if you increase weight a little bit and that decreases velocity a little bit, you still have a net gain of kinetic energy. And that's what's going to matter when it comes to terms of momentum for getting that arrow to pass all the way through an animal. And again, there's a lot of focus on speed and speed increases uh, the sound of the arrow. Well, while it doesn't really in the real world decrease the amount of time it takes an arrow to get to the target. And if you don't believe me, then do some math for yourself and figure out how long it takes a 300 foot per second arrow to get 20 yards versus a 265 foot per second arrow Um, to the target. It really doesn't matter. It, it, it's, it's, it's not a real amount of time, but when the reason that you've slowed your arrow down is an increase in arrow weight, now you're really getting a gain on your actual effectiveness. So I like a 650 grain arrow. That's what I shoot. It's what I shoot turkeys with. That's what I shoot <laughs> deer with. That's what I shoot bears with. That's what I shoot elk with. That's my arrow. Um, when I go out and shoot 3D courses, um, I shoot a 650 grain arrow. And usually when I shoot, people do two things. They go, wow, that's really quiet. And you have to realize that the sound that your bow makes is excess energy that it wasn't able to put into the arrow. And then when my arrow hits the target and the whole target goes like this, you're like, what are you shooting? <laughs> like, I'm shooting an adult arrow. Yeah. Okay. It like, it hits hard. That's the point. It's not a tickling competition. I'm out here to kill something. Yeah. That's, that's really good advice. I like that. Um, I think some of this kind of came up in, or, or you would at least you could start to, uh, your analogy is going to come back around. I, I don't know that we dove into it as much as we can. The, the number of blades, and this is, you kind of made the analogy to razors earlier, and, and you could do this with broadheads too. Uh, you know, I, I feel like uh, dollar shave company came out with an ad years ago and they, they said, you know, your razor doesn't need f- uh, five blades, a flashlight and a back scratcher. You know, it's like the, the, at some point they can be over engineered. What's your philosophy on that with broadheads? So think of, think of how it's actually cutting. Um, a four blade broadhead is cutting in two directions. So even though it's four blades, it's only two cuts, okay? A three-blade broadhead, I don't I can't do it with my hands, but you know what it looks <laughs> like, um, is cutting 
in three directions. And a, a single blade broadhead or, you know, a two blade, if you will, um, is only cutting in one direction. So the less cutting you're doing, the more penetration you're going to get. And, you know, I, if you're doing the thought experiment, you're like, okay, I want to do more cutting, but I want to penetrate as much as possible. Um, think of the total um, two-dimensional space that you're actually cutting. So if your broadhead is an inch wide and you penetrate 12 inches, then you have 12 square inches of cutting. Um, if you have a three blade broadhead, now you take, you know, the measurement from the center to the outside and say your total cutting circumference is an inch. So each blade is a third of an inch. Um, you know, you better be cutting more than 80% of that 12 inch distance. Otherwise you have a net loss of the amount that you're cutting. So if you can penetrate all the way through an animal with a single blade, you'll have done more cutting than you can with a three blade or with a four blade that did not penetrate as far. Um, and if you want pass throughs, this is just the way to do it. So I can tell you that, you know, last year I guided my 100th elk. Okay. Um, that, that is a pile of elk, especially if you consider that a hunter, um, across the nation only kills one elk every 10 years. Okay, that's a lot of lifetimes of, of elk that I've seen get shot. I can tell you that 100% of the elk I've seen get shot with single bevel broadheads, single blade broadheads, have gotten pass-throughs. I can also tell you that 100% of the elk I've seen shot with four blades and three blades did not get pass-throughs. So it is literally night and day. Yeah. And, and is that, um, and you may have kind of hinted at this, but I like to make sure everything's clear. Um, it, is a lot of that co coming from compression and and, and like kind of like the cutting example you gave earlier, like the the torque of you, you have all these different directions and it's hitting bone and it's creating force against the arrow from the, the multiple blades instead of that uh, you know the clean path through with one the one. Yep, that's yeah. exactly right. So you know you're you're just trying to cut through more surface and you have more resistance against the blades of your broadhead, so it's going to slow everything down. Um, and keep you from penetrating as far. You know, another thing that I want to throw out on shot placement is, is a lot of people think that shooting in the heart is the gold standard. Um, but when you actually shoot an animal in the heart, what you'll see is that it takes off running and it runs quite a long ways. Yeah. I would rather keep that heart intact and functional and hit an artery or hit lungs because what's going to happen at that point is the heart is going to continue to pump and it's going to leak all that blood out of the blood vessel that you cut. If you hit the heart, then the heart's no longer able to function. And all the blood that's in that animal's body, it can continue to use for a little ways. And if you're in a really brushy spot, that could put you in, in big trouble if that animal makes it 150 yards, which I've right. definitely seen on heart shots. So I really want people to focus on the top of the heart where those really big arteries and veins are coming out and the bottom of the lungs. And that's all in the same same zone. And it's a little bit farther forward than a lot of people are comfortable shooting, but I want you to do it. And if you have fear in your life that a white tail's shoulder blade can stop an arrow, brother, I gotta tell you, you, you need to change your arrow setup because I, I simply do not care. I will shoot through both shoulder blades and put that animal on the ground right now. Um, I shot, a white tail buck a couple years ago that was quartering towards me and it went through his shoulder through his entire body and out his pelvis and he died right there and that mm. arrow went another 30 yards past him wow wow yeah that's really good advice um i want to talk about brands in a second but what else have i not asked you about you're the expert is there anything i didn't kind of pull through uh to, to, that that you usually think of in in your setup you know there's um there's a, a lot of information out there about different types of steel and hunters tend to move towards stainless steel, but stainless steel, well, it doesn't have much of a maintenance requirement. It, uh, it does not perform as well as carbon steel. So if you can find carbon steel, do that. It's, there's a number of benefits. For one thing, it's less expensive. It gets sharper. It's easier to resharpen. 
And yeah, it can get a little bit of rust on it, but you know what? Wipe a little bit of oil on it and wipe it off. It's not, <laughs> not a big deal. So, you know, it's just a little bit of maintenance, but if you talk to broadhead companies, they will all tell you that they wish that they could use carbon steel for all of those reasons. But the consumers want stainless and you know, I would just encourage you to educate yourself on that a little bit and try and be the person that, you know, starts to reach out and ask for carbon steel because it's better. And we're seeing that in knives. Now more and more knife companies are coming out with carbon steel and people are blown away by it. It simply performs better, except that it can get a little bit of rust on it if you don't mm -hmm. take care of it. Yeah, that's, that's really good good advice. All right, man, if anybody's taking notes, they've, they've had to scratch down a lot of things that they're looking for. But also uh, in that brain of yours is all the experience that you've seen with different brands. And you, like you said, you've seen you've seen a lot of stuff come and go over those hundred elk and not to mention all the other things you, you hunt. Um, what what are your what are the broadheads you've seen perform well? Um, in, in, you know, uh, for where you are, we can we can stick with elk or just in general, like what broadhead brands have you been impressed by? Um. So there's a couple of American brands that work pretty well. One of them is called Kudu, and they make 100s and 125 grain. Those are both lighter than, than I prefer. Um, Kudu, you can uh, put uh, you can put an, an, an extra screw basically on. So it's got a male end on one end, female on the other, and that'll add 50 grains. Um, I've shot them, and they shot fine. I've killed um, both deer and elk with them. They come out of the package very sharp, so they're a good broadhead. Um, Helix is another um, good broadhead made by Strickland, also an American company. Um, it's a really thick blade, and you can get those all the way up to 200 grains. Grizzly Stick makes some fantastic broadheads. They're more on the expensive end of things. You might end up spending $120 on your broadheads, but, but they're wonderful. You know, they build them like knives that are flying through the air. And if you think about a knife, like if you buy a ten dollar knife, you can't really expect that thing to do very much. <laughs> right. But if you buy three broadhead, want to spend thirty dollars on that? Like you should expect ten dollar performance out of those things. Right. Um, the and that's a lot of the I price. Shoot, the, the, the price on the market, a lot of broadheads are in that price range. Yeah. Um, the broadheads that I shoot are called Cayugas, and they're from Australia. And the model that I shoot is the Pilot Cut. Um, you can get those in two blades or four blades. And the four blade is just a little insert that you can put in. Yeah. I don't use it, but, you know, if, if you want it, it's there. Um, those are really affordable. And our exchange rate with Australia is incredible. So you can get six of those broadheads for like $59 right now. All right. <laughs> um, and it takes a little bit of time for them to get on a boat and get all the way over here. Australia is a long ways away for anybody that doesn't own a globe. But, man, those things are awesome. And what I really like about them is that they're a single piece of metal. So they're a, they're a die-cast, forged, carbon steel broadhead. And uh, they come pre-sharpened, ready to go out of the package. And they have two aspect ratios and an aspect ratio is like slope, right? So they start out with a three to one aspect ratio, which is what's ideal for penetration. But you know, if you want a broadhead that's an inch wide, it has to be three inches long in order to get that three to one aspect ratio. And that's a lot of metal hanging out there. So what they do is they start with a three to one aspect ratio, and then they move to a broader aspect ratio at the back end of the broadhead. So it's, it's like, they call it a pilot cut because it's like drilling a pilot hole with a smaller drill and then uh, drilling right. in with your larger bit afterwards. Same concept and it functions the same way. Um, so you've, you've drilled the small hole, you've started the breaking process, and now you get to the wider part of the broadhead that's actually going to do the soft tissue cutting and give you that little bit larger wound channel. Um, you know, there's some mythology that a single blade broadhead um, will, will cut and through an animal and then that um, skin will, will fold back up like this. That's simply not the way skin works. Um, so imagine if you had a cut on your forearm that was in a line, is it just gonna snap back together? No, right. it is certainly not gonna do that. It's gonna <laughs> spread apart because the yeah. skin's not holding it together anymore. Yeah. Um, so when you hear stuff like this, just 
think it through a little bit and be like, okay, if this was on me, would that work? Right. Um, and it's like, no, it's going to bleed. <laughs> yeah. And skin's more elastic too. It's going to stretch back away from any, any wound, any exactly. I've had. I don't know about anybody else, but I, my skin seems to be rather stretchy at this point. It, it pulls away from the wound when you get cut. Yeah. And then the other thing is with a single bevel, when um, that goes in, because it's spinning as it goes in, it's actually going to cut a longer cut than the broadhead is wide. So if you have a one and an eighth inch broadhead, you might get an inch and a half long cut out of it just because the way skin works, because that skin is going to press in as the broadhead yeah. goes into it. That's a good point. And then as it stretches, it's going to cut. So you're cutting more of a surface like that. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I love your points on, um, you know, just the compression, the bone compression alone that you kind of talked about earlier. I don't think many people consider that, man. I think a lot of times it's like more is better. And, and that, and we, you know, as consumers, we're, we're, your, your brain's just kind of trained to work that way. But, you know, in, in this case, uh, everything you've just laid out, you know, keeping it simple actually seems to be the better route to go. And, and, um, yeah. The most important thing of all is that that broadhead doesn't fail. So you can't have a tip that bends over at all because as soon as that happens, it's going to be mm. curving into the, in, into a different, different direction. So you're going to lose all that good momentum that's going in one direction. So having a really strong tip that can't bend and then a blade that that's not going to break when it hits something hard and you know, wild game bones are more dense than domestic animal bones. So they can take a chunk out of a blade. So the thicker the blade is, the better. Um, and yeah, man, you just need to be able to think that, think of that thing like a wedge that's busting stuff apart. And if you've ever split wood, hopefully everybody split a piece of firewood at some point in their life. If you use an ax that's really sharp and weighs two pounds, you can swing that thing like Paul Bunyan and it's just going to cut like an inch and a half into the wood and nothing's going to happen. But if you use a splitting maul that weighs 12 pounds, that is so dull that you couldn't cut warm butter with it <laughs> and you hit that piece of wood, it goes flying apart. Yeah. It's like, why is that? Because you had more momentum, even though it was a lot slower, you had more kinetic energy because mass is king. Yeah, that's great. Great right there, man. I love it. Um, what, we kind of talked about this with the brands, but I told you I was going to ask you at the end. Um, it sounds like we kind of may have heard your your favorite piece of gear when it comes to broadheads, but archery gear right now, what's your favorite thing, man? This is always like how I like to wrap up a chat of, of everything that you're using. You you are in a very unique position that you, like I, I trust your recommendations because of what you've seen. So James Nash out in the field more than 300 days a year living out there. What's your favorite piece of archery gear at this moment? This is an easy one for me. It's that zero sight from Garmin. Oh um, yeah. No dude, kidding. I didn't see that coming. So, that... so incredible. Um, being able to range find while you're at full draw, like it just makes all the difference in the world. And it makes that harvest so much more ethical because you're no longer splitting pin gaps. You're no longer guessing. You have an exact reference for how high you need to hold. Um, and you know, it's, it's still illegal for hunting in Oregon. It's illegal in a handful of states. It's legal, I think, in over 30 states now. Um, man, just reducing that time and movement from going like this, range finding, clipping on a string, drawing, shooting. Yeah, dude, um, I've, I've been busted so many times. Draw. So many times at range when I'm ranging, you know. I, uh, <laughs> I actually have a Garmin Zero now. I haven't put it on my bow yet. Um, I, I, I had one, I had a test model and I got a, a newer one, uh, sent out and I've been so freaking busy this year. I haven't gotten to out. The one thing I'll say about those, they're a little trickier on the setup, uh, for a rookie like me, you probably set it up. No problem. Um, I'm, I'm not the best at setting up a site anyways. And there's some nuances to that thing, but when they, when they're tuned in, like, holy crap, it's so cool. And, um, I, what I love, like, I like the, I like it for the same reasons you just said to me, if it's like more accurate, 
less movement, you're not gaining anything. You, you still ranged an animal and you still have to perform at the end of the day. Um, it's still going to come down to you being able to shoot your bow. But if we can keep animals from getting spooked and, um, you know, I think, it, I think it has a real chance to lower, you know, injuries, uh, from, from shots. You know, I, I want a dead animal. I don't, I don't want to be chasing one for hours and, you know, uh, blood trails because I spooked it and it, it ducked and I put a bad shot on it. And I really think that that thing can, um, I think it can improve people just in the element that they're not spooking as much. Cause like you said, dude, this, this is a lot of, that's a lot of motion compounded, you know? Yeah. And, and time and in a dynamic situation like calling, um, man, you're moving all over the place. You don't get to stop and, and range seven different things and try and memorize all that. And it's not like you're sitting in a tree and you know, you know, this is 30 yards, this is 20 yards, whatever. You don't get that. And if you range that bull and then you come to full draw and say you're using a single pin sight or something like that, even whatever. And then he walks another 10 yards closer or he walks away at an angle. Now you're just guessing and you're guessing with yep. the animal's life. Yep. Like, there's no, there's no need for that. It's, it's less moral to take a gamble than it is to use technology and it's, it's not like we don't have the technology now. We have it in a separate device. <laughs> so who cares if it's consolidated into one device? It's I know, just dude, crazy to me. I, uh, people get so hardcore about that argument. And I'm like, yeah, but you're shooting a compound bow. And the same argument happened 30 years ago or whatever it was. You're like There was people that argued that compound bows were cheating and blah, blah, blah. And, and I'm like, I, I get, I understand you know, this desire for nostalgia or for keeping what we have, or maybe you, you, they, they think that there's less skill involved in it. But I think when, when you think about it, the way you just laid it out there, I, I don't see much room for argument against it. And usually when I talk to people about it, um, cause you, you know, we've worked with Garmin a little bit and I know, I know Chad pretty well that develop, uh, helped develop that product. And, to me, by the, when I start talking to pro people about it, they don't actually understand what it does. They, you know, I, it's like they, they haven't really thought through the fact that like, it's just your range finder and, and your bow sight combined. It's not, it's not doing anything for you. You still have to be good at shot placement and, and, and yeah. you know, uh, all of the mechanics of the shot still have to be there. It's just keeping that motion and, and limiting. It. And like you said, when they're moving, man, that's with whitetail, that's always the, the thing for me. Like, um, when rut hits, uh, before gun season, you know, with archery, those things are usually not coming through very slow. Like they're coming in on the prowl. They've heard a call, like they're all ramped up, they're ready to go. And it's, it can be hard to get them to slow down to a total stop. And that's a great time, a great tool to have in that scenario. Yep. No. So that's, uh, that's definitely a piece of gear that I'm stoked on. Um, I've used it hard over the last couple of years and, you know, for people who are concerned that it's electronic and it's going to break, man, I've, mine's ridden on me for like 3000 miles on my motorcycle. <laughs> like if something's going to break, it's going to break on a friggin' motorcycle. Yeah. So I don't know. It's a good piece of gear. I'm excited about the, the future of that technology and, and where it's at right now. Uh, I wish that I can hunt with it. And if you live in a state where you can hunt with it, you definitely need to consider it. Yeah, man. I like that. Um, I just, I'll call a shout out. I got a podcast on Restless Native with Chad who developed that product. And he talks a lot about it. If anybody wants to learn about it, uh, I think that's episode 54 or something. And then um, James was on my podcast as well. It's a great conversation. And we, we talk a lot about his personal background, which is awesome too. Uh, I'll, I'll try to remember to link to those two shows. But, um, and I know you're always booked up and you never really give a hoot about promoting what you do, but can we tell people where to at least follow you and keep track of you and uh, maybe, maybe give it your ranch a shout out? Yeah. Um, so you can follow me on, uh, on Go Wild. You know, I'm on there as James Nash. And uh, I'm on Instagram at Six Ranch Outfitters and Six Ranch Podcast. So if you're into podcasts, you can listen to my podcast as well. And uh, I answer everybody. So if you have questions, um, I will answer you. And sometimes I'm up until midnight doing it. But I, I literally answer everybody that, that has a question and, and I'm there for you because you know, when I was growing up in this stuff, I didn't have anybody. I, I had to figure all the stuff out the hard way. And uh, and there's value in that, but I also 
think that there's value in sharing the knowledge that we have. And, you know, when there's times that I have questions and stuff that I want to learn about, I want people out there that are willing to help me too. It's awesome, man. And, uh, I know James holds to that. I I've, I've known him long enough and I've seen it on our platform of him answering people's questions. And, uh, I, I will sometimes tag him because I know it's, he, he's going to respond if I tag him and try to get some help for somebody. So, all right, you guys check out James's, uh, James's accounts and find his content, but also all the gear that he's talked about. We're going to go in and make a list of his recommendations. We'll have that in the show notes. And, uh, James, man, thank you for coming on. This, this was awesome. I, I learned a lot and getting to talk and kind of pick your brain here. I need to apply this and get my bow tuned up for whitetail season, which is coming in hot. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm excited to see what you're able to do this year. And, and hopefully you can find an arrow system that doesn't give you any fear about whether your arrow is going to go all the way through it or not. Yeah, I'm going to take some of this uh, and apply it to my broadhead selection immediately. So <laughs> I'm going to get tuned up. Cool. I got I got like probably six weeks here before I'm out in the field. So I got time uh, to get it done, it, but it, it's closing fast. So, all right, man, dude, thank you so much. I appreciate it. This was awesome. I think it's really going to help out uh, new intermediate level archers. And I would be willing to bet, even if you've been shooting for 30 years, you probably just learned something if you made it the whole way through here. There's just so much knowledge every Every time I hear you talk about archery and hunting, man, I really appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's an honor for me. Thank you very much. Thanks, man. All right. Thank you, James Nash. What an insane amount of, amount of knowledge this guy has. I mean, I just continue. Every time I talk to him, I'm, I, uh, I almost feel not worthy. And if you like this show, you really got to check out my other podcast I did with James on Restless Native. It's, it's episode 53. And you know, we, we talk about a lot of different stuff on that show. It's Restless Native is more of a meandering show. You know, we kind of talk about a little bit of everything and let it go wherever we, it wants to. It's not as structured as Gearbox Talk. So if you're into that, uh, you know, some people tell me it's like a Joe Rogan style conversation. It just kind of flows and we talk about all kinds of stuff. I always say like, hey, this is Restless Native. We can talk about whatever we want to. And we do. And I do that with James too. It's, it's really interesting. And I'll also say if you're new to Gearbox Talk and you you like this episode, you're probably gonna like my episode that I did recently with Parker McDonald. Uh, it was it's all on, all on saddle hunting. We talk a, a, quite a bit about archery too, and that and and you know having the right setup that accommodates your your bow setup. This is gonna be really good for whitetail guys. So check that out. Reminder that all gear mentioned is in the show notes. It, you, purchasing that gear through those links is not only going to support Go Wild and Gearbox Talk, it's going to allow us to donate 1% of those revenues to outdoor nonprofits. So keep that in mind. You can download Go Wild to follow along with James and other gear gurus. And another cool thing you can do on Go Wild is if, if you don't want to drop a comment on the questions here, you can actually, or if you're already on Go Wild, you can log the show and tag me. So the way you're going to do that, hit the plus sign, hit Outdoor Podcast, you'll see Gearbox Talk, and then there's a list of all the episodes. Hit the episode you want to do, and then you can at mention me, just like you can on any any other platform, right? You at mention people with the at sign. You can do that on Go Wild as well and tag me. And this is cool because I get to see, you know, how you liked it. I get to hear your questions. And, you know, some of these I've been answering real time in shows. I'm like, oh, so-and-so had that question, and I'm going to, I'm, I'd like to know about whatever it is. You know, it could be like, uh, I think in an episode with the Hoffmans, Adam Smith had a question. We got it answered on that episode with them. So tag me in what you want to hear. And the other thing I'll tell you is if you know of somebody like, like somebody extremely knowledgeable, like a James Nash, who you would like to hear about a very specific topic, let me know. And I'm going to go out and find that person. I'm going to go out and get them. We'll get them on here and we'll dive as deep as you want to into whatever topic we can. Now, I'm not promising it tomorrow, but I am promising that I do have a list of everybody that, that you have been suggesting and I'm working my way through it. So we're doing a show a week. We're going to be motoring through some content and this is your show. You can be a part of it. Gearbox Talk is for everybody. This isn't just for me. This is this is because I realized that we all have questions and by getting these experts in here to sometimes ask beginner questions or sometimes ask questions that are more in the weeds and you know it's the kind of stuff you just aren't going to find in in a lot of these news articles or, or these these publications you know they're not hitting this stuff i'm going to get in the weeds with these guys and find these answers so I, I hope you'll log those shows or comment on there and let me know what you want to figure out because i want to make this as useful for you as possible all right a final thank you to everyone at the team at go wild uh, you know the, the the team here on the marketing side does so much work into the gearbox talk they are doing a ton of research on the gear that men is mentioned here 
they're using our system to pull the links for you all to be able to easily find that gear and they're using the system that our engineers built. So the, I got to thank the engineering team for all of the work that goes into the, the cool gearbox product on go wild to where, you know, where else can you go and search across 260,000 products to, you know, share a piece of gear and get feedback on it before you buy it or to see what other people are liking about it. I, I just, I don't know of anything like it. And I'm incredibly proud of the team that has helped make it possible. And they continue to just work tirelessly on this thing and they all have a vision for what we want it to be and which is really like i want i want go wild to be the best place to share learn and find gear like I, that's really what we're trying to be i i don't want to you know there's so many different directions you can go with an outdoor app but there's not a lot of great places that bring people together around education and and helping take out barriers so you know one by one we're just going to keep whacking those barriers out and taking them taking out the problems that are in uh, that we see keeping people from hunting and fishing and the outdoors. So thank you to the team that works tirelessly on, on that. And I got to say, I mean, anybody that would put up with a, a leader that has a mustache like this, there's something, they obviously love it. I don't know guys. I think, I think the mustache has seen its days. This might be the last you see of it at least for a while until no shave November comes back around. I think that's it. I think it's gone. Might be. I don't know. By the time you see me next time, yeah, I might even be posting before this goes uh, up on on the YouTubes and the, the podcast that it's gone. So we'll see. Actually, I guess that's a benefit. That's a benefit if you're listening to the podcast. You don't have to look at my mustache all the time. So maybe all the YouTube listener or viewers will convert over to the podcast. All right, that's it for me today. I'm out. <laughs>